So why is this making such an impact? I think this report's really having an impact because it sheds, it sheds light on a certain tactic of the hard right to redefine religious liberty. Religious liberty was meant to be a shield, not a sword. It was meant to be, and has always been for 200 years, the right of an individual not just to believe what they, what they believe, but to practice according to their faith. Uh, but that was meant to be a shield against government intrusion, not a sword to use to, uh, to justify discrimination against others. And what we've seen in the last 40 years has been an attempt to completely redefine what that word means. First, in the context of civil rights and desegregation, uh, religious liberty was used to prop up segregation and discrimination. And more recently, in the last 10 or 15 years, uh, to attack women's rights and LGBT rights. And this report describes that campaign in detail. It reveals that this is a coordinated, well-funded campaign, not some sort of grassroots phenomenon, and that it has as its aim not just protecting religious liberty, which of course all of us want to do, but limiting the civil rights of others. How does that work? Well, suppose I'm running a business and um, I don't want to serve uh, a mixed-race couple or a Jewish couple or a gay couple at my luncheonette or my wedding photography business or my hotel. Um, and I claim that the reason for that is, is some religious belief. So according to the Religious Liberty Campaign, the anti-discrimination law, which tells me that in America we don't discriminate and that everyone has to obey the law equally, that actually is oppressing me, the discriminator. Uh, so now, instead of anti-discrimination law protecting the actual victims of discrimination, the Religious Liberty Campaign turns, its, turns it on its head and says that anti-discrimination law oppresses those who want to discriminate. And what is the, um, what is the, um, in, what is the coalition that's being affected by this, the uh, repro LGBT? Mm -hmm. So the targets of the Religious Liberty Campaign are the same targets of the culture war that we've seen for the last 20 years, uh, attacking women's reproductive freedom, attacking LGBTQ equality. Those have been, not coincidentally, the main areas of focus of this movement, which is remarkable when you consider the various issues that might actually attract someone interested in religious liberty. Uh, but we saw, uh, we've really seen a tremendous amount of success on the part of the religious liberty movement. So for example, in discussing the uh, Obamacare, Affordable Care Act mandate around contraception coverage, uh, Congressman Paul Ryan mentioned the religious liberty argument at the vice presidential debate. That's really quite new. Uh, this isn't just a few fringe figures making the same case that they've always made. This was someone running for vice president of the United States who was parroting a line uh, which has been created and kind of think tanked and workshopped uh, in an alliance between uh, hard right conservative Catholics and hard right conservative evangelicals. The same alliance that brought us the pro-life movement. And who are the key players? So the key players are a very small network of conservative Catholic funded organizations, uh, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops uh, and an organization known as the Beckett Fund, uh, surrounded by some familiar players uh, from the hard right. So the Alliance Defending Freedom, formerly known as the Alliance Defense Fund, and uh, Family Research Council, and uh, the Christian Legal Society. These organizations have been around for a while, and what we've seen is a kind of a wholesale shift of rhetoric. Uh, from the kind of Bible-based dogma-spouting uh, antipathy, let's say, to LGBT people, to this new rhetoric of religious liberty. And why would people buy into this, the idea that businesses should be able to discriminate? Well, you know, the, uh, religious liberty is a value which all of us share. Uh, it was a progressive value before it was a conservative one. There's a, re a reason why the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which was passed about 20 years ago, passed 97 to 0 in the Senate. This is an area where, which was not partisan and on which conservatives and liberals really agreed. So we all support religious liberty. The question is what that means. Now, what, what we've seen and, and the data that's uh, discussed in the report is when this issue is depicted uh, according, in terms of the one person wanting to make their free religious choice. So I own a business and I don't want to provide contraception coverage. There's actually a high degree of resonance uh, because people don't sort of recognize what might be the next step. If I can withhold contraception coverage that someone might later use to purchase contraception, well, maybe I could withhold other forms of health insurance for my employees also. Um, and so it, there's, it's a very appealing argument. Fortunately, when the argument is turned back on its head and we see that the real victim of this discrimination is, for example, a woman who's not able to purchase the kind of health care that, that she wants to choose for herself, uh, we've actually seen that the, the argument doesn't succeed. But there's a lot of mistruths being peddled as well. And how, where have you seen that? So the, one of the most common uh, untruths in the religious liberty campaign uh, surrounds uh, same-sex marriage. 
that if there's civil same-sex marriage, that your clergy member, your minister, your priest, your rabbi, would be forced to solemnize a same-sex wedding. We know that's not true. Uh, the Religious Liberty Campaign knows that's, that's not true. Everyone knows that that would never happen. Uh, a clergy member could never be asked to or forced to contravene their own religious faith. And yet it's used again and again. Uh, I was on the ground in Minnesota around the marriage equality battle this past fall, and we saw it used. We saw people saying exactly that, and people believed it. Um, okay, well those are my questions. Is there anything else you think we should say? Mm. And now's the part which we edit out. <laughs> sure, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, I think what's most challenging about this campaign is that it's hard to spot. Uh, when there is a, a bunch of fanatics, let's say, protesting and saying outrageous things in front of an abortion clinic, well, we know what they believe and we know who they are, and we know that uh, while Americans may be divided on issues of abortion, that they really just represent a small fringe. But this is different. Uh, Stanford University just uh, accepted a large grant from the Beckett Fund to set up a Center for Religious Liberty at Stanford University. That's a, that kind of, those kinds of inroads were never made uh, by the original pro-life movement. Uh, and so it's difficult for progressives to really respond effectively to a, a, an argument rather than an enemy, uh, to a set of rhetorical strategies rather than sort of a clear uh, clash of cultures. And, uh, and that's no accident. This campaign has been designed to be effective uh, and to co-opt a progressive value, religious liberty, uh, and turn it into a conservative one. Thank you. That's great.